Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Now, as many of you recall, yesterday I put out part two of my series on the challenge questions offered up by Professor Dave to the Flat Earth. Challenge question number one was, make a working Flat Earth map. And our Flat Earth scholar did a very long video on this, but failed at it miserably. So I thought that I would help him out a little bit. It turns out I made a Flat Earth map not long ago, and I'm going to go ahead and present that now so that I can show you all that it can be done. So cue up the music and let's go. In the great battles for the hearts and minds between science and flat earth, one point has consistently surfaced. Show me an actual model of the flat earth. Unfortunately, those in Flat Earth have been unable to produce one. So I decided to step in and create the first scientific model of the Flat Earth for them. I will not rely on gravity, which mandates a sphere, nor on spaceflight, which clearly has shown the Earth to be a sphere. I'll just start off with the premise that the Earth is a flat plane of indeterminate size and only use observations from everyday life to define it. Looking at the Earth as a flat plane of indeterminate size is going to be a little difficult to handle, so I'm going to use this styrofoam disk to represent my flat Earth. I'm not saying it's round. I'm not saying it's small. I'm just going to use this disk so that I have something that I can handle. Now our first goal is going to be to decide if this disk is rotating somehow. There are two possible ways that a disk like this or a flat plane can rotate. We can twist it around like a record. However, that carries with it a problem, and that problem is centrifugal force. On a rotating plane, there's going to be a force causing objects on that plane to move from the center towards the outer edge. This is called centrifugal force. This is pretty easy to demonstrate on a rotating disc. All we need to do is put some pennies on it. As we put the disc in motion, the pennies will slide from the center of the disc towards the outer edge and slide off. This force would get stronger the further you got from the center of rotation and would be very easy to measure. We do not see such a force on the Earth. The other possible way that the Earth could rotate is flipping end over end like a coin. However, centrifugal force would also pull objects away from the center perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Once again, we do not measure this sideways acceleration on Earth. What we do measure is a uniform downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. The only conclusion is that the Earth is not rotating. It is a stationary flat plane. We do, however, see movement in the night sky. We see three distinct features. We see two swirling patterns that are the northern and the southern celestial poles, and then we see a series of parallel up and down lines at the celestial equator. Now we need to explain this movement over the flat and stationary Earth. Probably the easiest way to do this is use the flat Earth concept of a dome. With a dome, we can have the stars actually embedded in the material of the dome, or the dome can represent a cloud or a belt of stars that circle the Earth in unison. If this dome was centered over the North Pole, the stars would rotate about that point. The North Star would remain still and the stars would form a circular pattern around it. There is, however, a problem as you go south as the stars would become closer and closer to the horizon and would begin to move parallel to the horizon without a distinct southern celestial pole. However, this is not what we observe on the Earth. What we do see in the north is the stars moving counterclockwise and circling the North Star. We see the celestial equator with stars moving in parallel from horizon to horizon. And then we see a southern celestial pole with stars moving in a clockwise fashion we have no choice but to discard the idea of a single dome over the Earth. One possibility would be that this dome over the Earth is a long tube. However, the Earth is as wide east and west as it is tall north and south. It's not diamond-shaped or oblong. 
That leaves us with this shape, a spherical dome that goes around the entire Earth, both the top and the bottom. This shape would easily account for the rotation about the northern and southern celestial poles and the celestial equator. It also raises a couple of other interesting possibilities. First of all, there are 12 constellations in the zodiac. Each of those constellations is visible from the Earth at most for six months at a time. Where does it go during the other six months? Well, under this model, it would be underneath the Earth and out of sight. Likewise, the sun could set in the west, go under the earth, and then appear to rise in the east in the morning. Now, another interesting thing is that the earth would be limited in size by this dome because it must fit within it. It would have to be some specific north, south, and east, west dimension of the surface of the earth. But perhaps more interestingly, there has to be a limit to the depth of the earth. The diameter of the Earth could be no greater than the diameter of the dome. The depth of the Earth could be no deeper than the radius of the dome. Since there is a limit to the depth of the Earth, the question becomes is what is supporting the bottom of the Earth? I suppose we can leave that question to future flat Earth scientists. Surprisingly, telescopes with equatorial mounts may well work on this model of the Earth. That is another problem that has been facing Flat Earth for quite some time. Now one problem that does need to be solved is the location and the orientation of the northern and southern celestial poles. Let me demonstrate what I mean here. Let's take a strip of paper and make that run along a line of longitude. We'll use 0 degrees and 180 degrees so we get one that runs completely across the surface of the Earth. In the center is the North Pole. Now that nail in the center represents the axis on which Polaris must lie. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the tip of the nail, it could be higher, but it has to be along that line. Likewise, Cygna Octaris, the southern celestial pole, has got to lie along the line of the nails at the edges of that disk. Now going back to our hemispheric dome model, we can see the problem here. We have the North Star somewhere in the middle of that dome along that middle nail. The Southern Stars will be out by the nails by the edges of the disk. As the disk rotates, we'll have a normal pattern about the North Star moving counterclockwise. However, the Southern Celestial Poles will move parallel to the ground. This is not what we see from the ground, so we're going to have to modify our model a little bit. To solve this problem, the northern and southern celestial poles need to be on the same line, and that line will serve as the axis of rotation for the spherical dome over the Earth. We can solve this problem by replacing the nails at the northern and southern celestial poles with a wire. This wire will form the axis of rotation for the spherical dome overhead. This will require the curving of the surface. And another problem that we have is what to do with the other celestial pole. We can solve this problem by taking advantage of another observation that we have made. The stars around the southern celestial pole are the same no matter where we see them from south of the equator. This suggests a single southern celestial pole rather than multiple celestial poles, which would have different stars around them. Since both southern celestial poles are actually the same location, we can bend the other line of latitude around and hook it up on the wire the same way as we did with the first. That yields an interesting shape. And more importantly, it gives us another way for this shape to rotate. We can spin it like a coin on a table. Now as the coin spins about an axis per perpendicular to that axis, we will have centrifugal force. This force would tend to pull objects away from the axis of rotation and it would be maximum at the widest part of the coin. This suggests an interesting experiment regarding weight. As weight is the function of mass times the acceleration acting on that mass, and centrifugal force would oppose that acceleration and lessen it, it would follow that objects on the equator would weigh less than objects further from the equator. Now here we have a 500 gram reference mass on a very sensitive scale in Perth, Australia, 32 south latitude.
Now if we take this same scale and reference mass further away from the equator to Canberra, Australia at 35 south latitude, we find it weighs 0.16 grams more. After a quick stop back at Perth to check the calibration, we take it up to Broome, Australia at 18 south latitude and find that it weighs 499.44 grams, which is less. This confirms that objects closer to the equator weigh less than objects further away from it. This suggests that our ring model of the flat Earth is indeed rotating, like a coin on a table. However, that is one long line of longitude that goes all the way across the Earth. Let's add a few more. Now we have this shape. We can make some predictions on this shape as well. For example, in the spherical dome over the Earth, perhaps the stars are not moving. It's the Earth that's rotating. For example, the sextant has presented a problem on the flat Earth. We can't seem to get the latitude right on a flat Earth with a local Polaris. Let's use some elegant animation by Joe Lace to see whether or not maybe we can explain this on our model. Well, let's see if some other problems can be solved with this shape of the Earth. For example, if we looked at Chicago from 60 miles away, we would just see the top of the buildings on this shape, and indeed, we do. At 123 miles, we'd be missing the bottom 6,000 feet of Mount San Jacinto in California, and indeed we are. Flight paths would be along a great circle course rather than a straight line, and indeed, they are. Rocket launches from the 1940s would demonstrate a curved horizon, and they do. As we see in everyday observations, the sunset illuminates the bottom of the clouds, and then the sun sets below the horizon as night falls. Ring laser gyros would measure rotation while sitting on a table. Water levels would demonstrate that the horizon is below the eye level of the observer as they do. Seismic waves would propagate in very distinct patterns. This is observed on Earth following earthquakes at any location throughout the Earth. The result is that using common observations and logic, we have a working model of a flat Earth. It is the spherical globe Earth. Well guys, thank you very much for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And as you can see, there is a working flat Earth map. It's called our globe Earth. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe down there. Maybe check out a few of these wonderful playlists. And I'll see you again soon. Take care.